Hizmet is very trusting. So Hizmet is not fundamentalist. Hizmet is not radical, uh, precisely because Hizmet has the deeper faith, the deeper faith in God, the deeper faith in human beings that these fundamentalist radical groups don't have. My name is Loy Ashton, and I am the Associate Professor of Religious Studies and the Director of the Center for International Studies and Global Change at Tougaloo College, as well as the Director of the Honors Program at Tougaloo College. Uh, I also am an ordained clergy person in the United Methodist Church. So I would say that over these last 10 years, not only have I had an opportunity to research what the movement is about, but also to work with the movement with respect to the kind of social engagement and interfaith work and dialogue that the movement does here locally in Mississippi. And I think it's been very impressive how interfaith dialogue over the last 10 years has really made a huge leap forward. And I credit much of that progress to the work of our Turkish friends here in the Hizmet movement with the Raindrop Center and with the Dialogue Institute. The movement to me, I think, is I mean, it's a civil society movement. I mean, that's the sociological analysis. It, its name comes from service, uh, but service can mean many different things. To me, what I see the movement is, is an outgrowth of people who want to make their society better and who have a spiritual yearning to see human beings flourish and to see human beings successful, to see them safe, to see them prosper, to see them love each other and form deeper communities of friendship and of mutual care. Uh, so I, th I see how the religious values and the spiritual teachings behind the beliefs of many of the members of the, of the movement inform their actions in community. And the closest analogy that I really have to it, and part of the reason why I'm so interested in this movement, is because I see a deep parallel between the Hizmet movement and how it translates its inner spiritual work, you know, the, the work of bettering oneself and in their relationship with God through its expression in the community and trying to improve the community and make this a better society with the Methodist movement of the 18th century in both um, England and in the United States and how John and Charles Wesley and many of their colleagues saw this need for what they called personal sanctification, becoming more holy, connected to social sanctification. And then the two were mutually interdependent. You couldn't grow closer to God in your relationship with God without caring for your neighbor. And likewise, you couldn't care for your neighbor in any meaningful way that wouldn't be patronizing or condescending if you didn't see them as an equal. And that only comes from being able to see your connection to them through a divine source. And so one's personal spirituality informed one's social action. One's social action was an outgrowth and deepened one's personal spirituality. So the two went hand in hand. The other component, I think, that reminds me very much of the Methodist movement is not only this very community-centered action that Hizmet does that's connected to personal piety, but also the sense that it's deeply humble. It's not trying to tell other people, well, you don't understand who God is, or you're following God the wrong way, or you're living the wrong kind of lifestyle. Hizmet, are, they, are, they are very gentle, they are very open, uh, they were very receptive to many different varieties of peoples and cultures and lifestyles uh, and ways of knowing God and ways of living out one's faith. And they don't try to tell people what's right or wrong. They don't try to tell people, you know, your particular belief system is incorrect or anything like that. Rather, they, they just try to live out this care 
and love that they have uh, of God for other people in their in their hospitality and in their generosity and in their kindness. And the focus on education, right? That's the other piece that's so much, I think, a similarity with early Methodism was the Methodists knew that the only way that they were going to be able to achieve both personal holiness, personal sanctification, and social sanctification was through schools. So it's one of the reasons why of all of the Protestant denominations in the United States, the Methodists were the ones who built after the, uh, well, <clears throat> of the Christian colleges, the Catholic universities were the largest number, and then after that was the Methodist colleges. Because you can't, unless people are learning, unless people are educated, they can't better themselves and they can't better their world. So education is key to that. And I see that with Hizmet as well. And it's not education in terms of indoctrination. It's not saying, okay, we want to teach our children about the right ways to pray or the right ways to interpret the Quran or anything like that. No, it's actually, it's education for education's sake. It's about learning about human nature. It's about learning about the world. It's about sciences and the arts and literature and language. Um, and out of that, then, you increase the capacity of the young person to be able to engage their world more intelligently, more meaningfully, and then they can make their own decisions about what kind of a spiritual path they want. And I think that's a very, A, it's a very trusting position. It trusts human nature. B, it trusts God to say that, look, we don't have to indoctrinate people because we know if God has a relationship with them, God is already doing that one-on-one -on -one with them anyway. Our job is to help them just to know what they need to know to function well in the world and to be a good citizen, uh, a global citizen. Uh, we don't have to necessarily, you know, shape their theological framework. That's something that they're mature enough to do on their own in their relationship with God. And so it, it shows to me a great deal of, of faith in, in God. Hizmet is very trusting. So Hizmet is not fundamentalist. Hizmet is not radical, uh, precisely because Hizmet has the deeper faith, the deeper faith in God, the deeper faith in human beings that these fundamentalist radical groups don't have. Um, so Hizmet doesn't have to go around saying, okay, here's what you believe and here's what you shouldn't believe. No, Hizmet just says, look, we're going to teach you what everyone in this planet needs to know about science and medicine and technology and human rights and math and art and literature and history. And then out of that wealth of knowledge, you'll be a better informed human being so that you can learn about other cultures and other peoples. And of course, that will bring you closer to God if you're someone who's a thoughtful person. And even if it doesn't bring you closer to God, at least it will help you to appreciate the value of other people in other ways. Um, and then, you know, where God is in your life can be sorted out in other ways between you and God at some point when it's, when that's the right thing to do. Fatul Kalan, obviously he is one of the intellectual and spiritual leaders of the movement. Uh, he was an imam uh, in Turkey in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, based in Izmir and other places, a uh, very popular preacher, one who helped to give a message of modernization that uh, Islam and modernity were not incompatible, that Islam was very much comfortable with science, Islam was comfortable with democracy, Islam was comfortable with pluralism, globalization, uh, differences of identity, differences of culture, differences of belief, that none of this was antithetical to being a Muslim. And so what Gulan helped to do in that moment in Turkey, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even in the 90s, was to be able to give Turks a way to embrace their faith without having to be defensive and without having to um, apologize for, um, you know, somehow having the faith take away you know, their, their cultural achievements. And Gulan said, look, we can still be Turks, we can still be religious without having that threaten our society or our government or having that be dangerous to anyone else. Um, and we can also engage the world. We can, we can become you know, someone, we can become a, a culture and civilization um, that contributes to the global 
human progress. <clears throat> so that message, I think, was very popular. Many Turks uh, really responded to that. It gave them hope about how to be Turkish, how to be Muslim, and also how to be modern and how to be global. Right? You didn't have to make choices between those things. So it empowered many Turks. Um, but then that message spread outside of Turkey, and it spread to many other Muslims around the world in, uh, in Europe particularly Turks living in Germany, or in Central Asia, uh, where you have you know, Turkic language speaking peoples. Most recently, it spread to Asia. It spread to Africa. And now it's also spreading outside of the Muslim world, as many non-Muslims are reading Gulan's writings. And Gulan is being lifted up as a thinker and a theorist and a spiritual leader who advocates pluralism and dialogue and nonviolence, much the way that Martin Luther King did, much the way that Mahatma Gandhi did, much the way that Thich Nhat Hanh does. So you have Gulan now being put in those circles along with King and Gandhi and Thich Nhat Hanh to say, okay, here is a Muslim voice for an advocacy for peace, an advocacy for nonviolence, an advocacy for you know, being good neighbors, uh, respecting our differences, not trying to make all of us be the same, and seeing, you know, the identity of the divine in all of these differences. Um, and so many, many non-Muslims are, are now becoming interested in and in st starting to read about, you know, Gulan's writings. Um, Gulan himself is a person who is very unassuming. He's, I think, more than a little uncomfortable with a lot of this focus on him. He would rather see people focus on the movement itself um, rather than him. He's just one person. He has said on a number of occasions that if he could call what he was trying to motivate people to do, uh, he would say, well, this would be a, you know, a movement of human beings trying to achieve high human values. But we all know that's a mouthful. That's, that's a difficult thing to say. So his met became the kind of shorthand for, in a sense, humans trying to achieve high human values. And those human values, again, are you know, human dignity, human worth, human security, human safety, um, human education, uh, human responsibility, human care and concern for each other, uh, even environmental responsibility. You know, these, are, these, are things that these, these are what these high human values are. So Gulan has become inspiring not just among the Turks in Turkey where it's, the message was first heard, not just among the Muslims in Europe where it expanded to, or the Muslims in Central Asia or in Africa, but even now to a global community that's become interested in his writings and interested in his preachings because he's a voice of faith. He's a voice uh, within a religious community that A, doesn't have to put his religious identity aside, but at the same time doesn't force that identity onto anyone else and says, let's come together, use our religious teachings, use our wisdom traditions, use what we've inherited in our religious communities to make improvements, to better our world rather than cause division, rather than cause war, rather than cause violence. Um, because we know, obviously, how religion can be misused. Um, for political ends or for military ends. Um, we know how religion be can become brutal, how it can you know, drive people to do very um, <clears throat> terrible things. And, and Gulan is one of those voices uh, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, who's saying, no, that's not what religion is for. Religion is actually meant for human beings. As, as a Christian, I would say, the way Jesus said, to have life and to have it abundantly. That's the purpose of these religious teachings. And Gulan, from his point of view, as a Sufi Muslim teacher, is trying to show what that looks like from the Islamic perspective. And I see his met um, engaged in the type of teaching that leads people to look at deeper issues in life while remaining fully faithful in their approach to life. And that is something that I really, truly, and sincerely appreciate. I think also non-Muslims around the world have been able to see Islam in a new way through Hizmet, in a way that's positive, in a way that's open, 
in a way that's um, interrelational, um, in a way that's about neighbors coming together and valuing each other rather than, you know, cultures in conflict.